All right, good evening. This is the special meeting and budget workshop for the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education on Monday, August 26, 2019 at 5 p.m. at Longfellow Center. Melissa, please call roll. Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannon. Here. As a reminder, there will be an extended reception of visitors following the workshop presentation. We ask that anyone intending to make a comment during this time fill out a card and turn it in at the time, uh, at this time, so we can adhere to our 30-minute time frame and give everyone a fair, a fair opportunity to speak. At this point, we're going to go ahead and, and kick off the budget workshop with Todd Drayfall. Got the singer's microphone here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do I get the lights there so it's easy. Well, yeah, you know, with both lights off, you can see it. It's easier to see if you uh -huh. could do that. I adjusted something. So, oh. good evening, everyone, board. Um, this is the next step in our FY20 budget process. Uh, um, we have initially started this, uh, the budget starts out actually technically last October uh, with the initial presentation of the tax levy because that's our, our funding source and we go through that piece. Uh, there is a, you know, the April uh, workshop where you have a review at the July meeting, there was a tentative budget. Uh, we have this meeting, this meeting um, the budget is on, on display and then at uh, the September board meeting you have a budget hearing and adoption of the budget. So. Once this wakes up, uh, any presentation, any conversation about the budget, we always start out with uh, district mission. So we always go back, go back to the mission um, and our strategic plan uh, to center, you know, our allocation of resources into uh, what is we do and, and focus uh, based on those things, and the mission, the vision, and, and, and the goals of our district. So uh, that's always the piece that we start out with. Um, mission of the District 58 is partnership, partnership with parents and community is to challenge and engage each child by providing quality educational programs and support services in a safe, nurturing, child-centered environment in order to prepare all students to be lifelong learners and contribute members of a global society. Then we go to our strategic plan, and we're always looking, as we've gone through the last year, uh, with, with our, our councils and, and focusing. And actually, we have the district leadership team tomorrow evening, afternoon, uh, to review uh, updates on, on those goals, but connecting to the community, focusing on learning and securing the future. And so those, those two have a focus as to what, you know, for resources and how we are, are moving forward um, in executing uh, those goals. So some of the notable impacts of fiscal year 20 is that we have added uh, 9.8 um, full-time equivalents uh, for, from above the 19 levels, uh, three classroom teachers, one by literacy teacher, uh, 1.0 art, music, PE. That doesn't mean we have one person teaching art, music, and PE. That would be really good. Um, I keep telling Jane to find those people, but, you know, they don't exist. So, um, but, but we've extended um, uh, time periods and so forth, so there are, you know, the equivalency adds up. Uh, there's also a piece where we're adding in, um, due to the change in the professional development, um, that have, you know, those fluctuations and those adjustments to the schedule have allowed for that add, which, going to the bottom piece on this, on this slide, this slide is the weekly art cl classes and that adjustment that allows for that piece. Uh, also 2.3 nurses, um, CSNs and RNs, um, we have a goal, obviously, to move towards, you know, more CSNs, and we had, you know, we have some positioning pieces, and we talk about 2.3, those are 2.3 equivalent staff positions added from last year. However, in some cases, depending on circumstances, some of that staff position becomes certified RN, and sometimes when, you know, uh, we're in a, in a between, you know, having between filling positions, um, contracted service. So the goal is, goal is to meet that service level. Obviously, the, the goal is to have full-time people in, you know, in those positions. However, sometimes given the nature of our labor market, um, you know, sometimes that is contracted service. Uh, 1.5 FTE in the curriculum coordination and assistant principal positions, those are an add, uh, and uh, another, another adding 
a full-time uh, psychologist, as well as I talked about the weekly art classes, and that's going from every other week to a weekly piece, um, and that's part of with adjustments with the uh, early learning, uh, the early release that allowed for some of that to, to get adjusted. Additionally, uh, we have the new science curriculum. We have budgeted annually every year. Part of the you know is is an is a curriculum ad. Last year was ELA. Next year is math. See, I got that right. Um, and so we continually have a piece, you know, and it adjusts depending on, on parameters, what we know that bid, that bid and, and what that's going to come out to be. Uh, we adjust that on an annual basis. I think actually we saved a little bit from last year to this year because just the cost was down a bit. So, you know, the actual amount is less than last year, but you know, still that curriculum piece and that professional development is in there. Um, adjustments to early release. Um, one of the things we estimated is about a $50,000 $50, increase in transportation costs because of that schedule change. Um, so that is in there. Budgeted, uh, we also have um, something we've talked about several times through FAC uh, and, and board meetings is a 14% increase in health insurance. Um, that breaks out to a, essentially a 9.9% .9 increase on July 1st at the, begin at the beginning of the fiscal year. And we don't know yet what the recommendation will be uh, come uh, January 1st. Uh, that will be coming to you, as we've said uh, at, at previous meetings from the Wellness Committee in October. Uh, but understand that that extra 4% represents the max of an 8% increase because it's a half a year. So if, and, and I will tell you just as a ballpark right now, I think the, the high end that we're looking at at the wellness community is about six and a half. So, you know, we are concerned, you know, when we put the numbers together and initially looking at things, you know, we're going at what we were seeing at worst case, uh, uh, things have improved. And so we're hoping, you know, that we won't have that 8%. We'll be looking at something less than that, somewhere six and a half, hopefully six. Uh, so there will be some, some room uh, on that insurance piece when, when, when that adjusts. So you have that piece in there. Uh, also the, the four and a half, four and a half percent increase in the transportation contract. Um, there is also one thing, it is an offset because it's both an in and an out. It's $1.7 million, it's in the capital fund. Uh, for the for playground equipment that is part of the state budget uh, that was approved as a member initiative uh, through Representative Senator Stava Murray and it's both on the revenue side and the expense so there's no net impact to the district uh, as far as a budget standpoint um, we don't know you know as soon as we have information from the state as to how that process will work and how they have that funded and structured uh, then we'll know more and we'll know how, know how to, to go about that piece. Um, but we know that we anticipate, you know, that in, uh, as part of this next fiscal year, and so that piece is in there as well. I'd like to go through this chart in detail. No. Um, because this is in there for you to, to have later on. This is our recap uh, budget detail report. You will see it again in your packet in September. It has a beginning balance, the uh, revenue by source, expense by object, and then ending balance and end estimates, and, and cash on hand uh, um, for each fund and overall. Um, have that in there just to kind of put it in as you have that information. Obviously, it's a little hard to read on a pre presentation, so we'll go, go too in-depthly in it. We will actually go to um, a little more easier uh, format to read, and that is we'll look at the graphs and the structure. So uh, um, revenue, 73.65%, uh, I'm sorry, 73.6 .6 million dollars. 78% uh, of that comes from property taxes. 80% of that comes from property taxes. 80%, 78. 78. So, um, and we break out by, by structure, you know, 62 is residential. We have a strong commercial industrial or commercial base that helps, uh, and that commercial base is worth almost $12 million in revenue. Um, increases from fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20 in revenue. We have a slight increase in our state, state aid formula. You can see, you know, again, all those increases are important. They all help cover. Uh, our increase in state aid essentially is almost the equivalent of two FTE. Um, However, it is a smaller portion compared to 
you know, the overall resident, you know, the overall property tax piece, as well as a corporate personal property replacement tax, the CP CPPRT, which is a tax that we receive from the state uh, that uh, has increased substantially. Um, when you look at budget to budget, you'll see a huge increase. Uh, that's because we exceeded our revenue projection last year in property tax. We received 100%. We anticipated being prorated. Well, well, the state told us at the beginning of that last fiscal year that we would be prorated. We budgeted accordingly. Um, it turned out to be a good year because it's based on corporate income. And because it was a good year, we received additional, you know, all of what we uh, were, the state had anticipated. Um, it is in, in, increased for the next year, and so we have that part as well in there. Interest income is, we, have, we exceeded that budget as well. We have increased that this year. Um, we've looked at, and obviously the last few months have been a concern about interest rates sliding. However, the interest rates are, rates are still better off now than they were 12 months ago for us. And, this, and, and the interest rates are good when we have money. So right now, as we have money in the bank, and if you, looked at, if you look at your July and then look at, your, uh, at the next um, revenue report with a year-to-date and look at that interest income, income piece and compare it, there's going to be a substantial amount of increase from last year at this time because we have money sitting in the, you know, in the money market funds that are getting a decent interest rate above where we were last year at this time. Um, if interest rates start to slide, um, that may be okay because they're going to start sli sliding when we're getting towards our lower cash. So um, right now it doesn't pay for us to do investment pieces because we're making more money with it sitting in the money market than we would be in four, five, six month CDs. And we can't go up past that because we'll need those cash to pay uh, for bills later on. So. Todd, where does that 1.7 fit into that pie chart? 1.7 million is, what? it's actually, well, in, overall it's in capital. I'm coming up here to look at, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's in capital, but it's in, it's going to be in other state. So you have that other state's about $3.8 million. Part of, you know, that's in that, it, it's in that piece. And it, you know, because, it, one, it's an offset, but a two, because it, we put it all to the capital fund, so it doesn't it doesn't inflate over all the operational piece and you know show it as any piece. I wasn't going to go over this chart. It is it is a comparison piece of FY19 to FY20 and just the increases um, by source. Switching over to expenditures, um, this graph we are a service organization. Service organization is based on salaries and, you know, on people. And so salaries and benefits are the predominance of what we do. And so you see the big blue line, uh, that's $40 million. That is salaries in the education fund. Um, you know, that is the, the lion's share. share. The orange is the benefit piece. You see the orange in the ed fund. Um, and then in the IMRF social security fund, those are, you know, those payments that we make. Um, it, you know, for those expenses. I also want to point out that green, I'll put it over here. I hope that works. This green line over here is other tuition. That is private placement and uh, our tuition, pay, our payments to SASIC, which essentially is salaries and benefits. Um, looks at like a different format, but that's essentially what that is. Um, and, that's, and that also is a big you know, expense in, in exceeding $5 million. And again, you know, we have the comparison chart uh, for expenses from budget to budget, and looking at about a 7%, 6.9% increase budget to budget. Now, expense to budget is, is a little less than that. Um, in some areas, we exceeded. Um, but we, we, you know, we, we do believe, believe everything put together, we are in a position that we have a balanced budget, you know, uh, that we're presenting. So, you know, we have a balanced budget that we believe that strong in our, our projections on, on revenue and resources, that those are going to be, you know, funds are going to be coming in available. Uh, um, and we base it on four payments from the state um, coming in, as well as 
all of our estimates that we have in right now as far as um, what we understand from the state as far as revenue. Now the other piece is that we, one of the things that we've been talking about administratively is we will have to make sure that we may maximize all use of grant for, of federal grant money and you know, work to be as effective and efficient in that usage uh, for professional development and those purposes that are required so that we can maximize that piece and, and hope to help you know, use that um, in a more effective way. With that, if there are questions on expenses, I'm going to talk about fund balance next, but I actually want to get to this piece. So overall, we bring in, we spend essentially everything we're, we're, we're uh, bringing in. in it. Um, you have the overall, the beginning balance is the blue area, uh, the orange is revenue and expenses is the gray, and then the ending is the, is the green over there. Um, one piece is you have the working cash piece. That is our internal bank that we utilize when uh, we have you know, low revenue and, and low, low cash on hand that we need to borrow, and we transfer that fund into other funds to cover bills uh, in the low cash point during the year. And we'll talk about that in just you know, the next step, but before that, uh, questions on revenue and expenses overall. seen this budget before, so it's not a surprise. Uh, you shared that we have an estimate. Right, is your mic on? Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Um, you shared that uh, this budget before, so it's not a surprise, but we also are projecting an ending balance uh, above, uh, above, above expenses of about $3,000, which, uh, sorry, not accurate? Hold on. I'm looking at, I forgot what slide number this is. It's slide five, we're looking at the total, but not the operating Look at the operating. It's 119. Yes, I mean, either way, whether it's 3,000 or 119 on a $73 million budget, in some ways it's not. The differential is, is, minim is minimal um, because even you know, 119 is good. We are spending in everything we are taking. And so we are. Uh, my question still stands, I guess, as we are, as, as history goes, we, are, we, are, we tend to be conservative in our budget and we then end up coming under budget in some places. Uh, one of the places you said that we might be under budget is our medical claims, but we also plan to account for that by uh, increasing our premiums at a lower rate in January. Um, and so what, what other line items should we expect in FY 1920 that will possibly come under budget? We're being more conservative. <laughs> well, there's one, there's a couple. <laughs> Being taped, so I'm not sure. <laughs> um, there are some areas we came in over, and one of the things that we we did in FY20 is we went back and looked at what our year-to-date was in some areas, and brought them up considerably. We also brought some down, um, some areas that um, we had continually budgeted something and 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 didn't fortunately have those expenses. Uh, so we, we, we did a lot of truing up of account by account on this 20 budget. So I would say this is a, a very, very tight budget. Um, I would, this is tighter than I would normally like to see. Um, just, to, just as, you know, not having a lot of wiggle room. We really don't have a lot of wiggle room in expenses. Uh, and sometimes you can come in, you know, it's always a little bit of a trick to be a business manager to say, look, we got this thing. It's going to be $5,000 or $10,000, but we really would like to start this in January. Can we do it? And, you, you know, our goal is always to find a way to do that. I'm going to tell you today that's, prob that's, that's something else I'm going to have to know for absolute certainty will not come to fruition to be able to say to do that because normally we could do that piece. I, I don't feel comfortable right now today saying that that's pos it's possible in this budget with this format. Um, given what, you know, I, I think we're good on a resource allocation piece and our projections are, are, are fairly good and will come to fruition. Um, and I have, you know, we're not increasing some weird revenue number, but I, I you know, on the expense side, I, I, think, I think we're very tight. So um, 
it'll be a close, it'll be a close number. We actually, and if you look back, we ended up three, on a cash balance piece, we ended up $300,000 to the good for FY19. We projected, I think, a little bit better than that uh, at the initial number, it was like six or 700,000. So we did a road from, from beginning to end. Now, there, you know, there's a lot of different fluctuation pieces in there um, and some revenue shifts and, and, and so forth that helped, but there's also some expense side that came in there too. We also had two contracts unsettled at that point, so there was some, some give and take on, on that as to what those were gonna come up to be. So does that help answer the question? Except I didn't answer the question. It helps answer the question. I Which think that I'm, from like a fiscal responsibility perspective, I'm just wondering how do we rationalize this tight of a budget against fiscal responsibility? Yeah, we, I, I, I think, you're on. Yes. I guess the way I would ask that question, the question is if we look at that first couple slides, they're all ads, right? We're, we're adding to the budgets um, without identified additional revenue to Right, these were, I mean, we've added, we have increased expense. Now, we've increased expenses and in, in, an added program and made adjustments. We've also made adjustments. I mean, we have adjusted things on the other side of it as well. We've found, you know, we went through and, and, and found some areas that we weren't, we were underspending. We also found some ways to make adjustments um, that would not impact to, to classrooms. You know, I was talking about the, you know, the Pitney Bowes, you know, some of the, some of the silly stuff about some of the contracts with the, with the phones and, and copiers and some of those things. We're working to find those efficiencies to find resources to help and assist in some of those areas. Now, we didn't get nine positions from copiers and phone lines and Pitney Bowes machines, but you know, all of those little pieces help. We, you know, we keep working on that end um, to, to do that. But yes, we didn't have a significant over increase in revenue that automatically brought all of those up above anything else outside of you know just you know the, the money that we have from coming in from the state and obviously the normal in increase in, in property taxes. Just to address the revenue point, it looks like and um, I'm not sure what slide number I'm on right now. Um, let me see if I can figure that out. I can't. Slide twelve. The this is slide, 12. Uh, slide twelve. We have revenue of last year sixty eight point nine. Uh, and, and this year, I think I saw a slide where we had revenue of 73.6. Yes. So that's not an insignificant amount of increase in revenue. No, it is, it is an increase. It's a, it's I a mean, relative chunk. to previous years, we've had about a million dollar bump each year. Um, this year, we have a four million bump. Which gives so us some of that, you gotta take out the 1.7 one, the 1. in capital. Mm -hmm. Ah, right. Because that's you've got right. that, I mean, that, and that, I mean, when you look at the overall, yeah. you've got that piece and capital that helps. Right. No, that's a good point. Um, and that's also, I mean, it's on both sides of the equation on the overall. Right. So, really need a wireless. <laughs> a workers' comp thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is that any more on, do you need to um, answer your questions? I don't think as a, as a board, we're cutting it close. Cutting it closer than we've ever have, ever have historically, it seems, at least as long as I've seen, not as long as I've been here, but as long as I've seen. Um, well, I think two years ago, you, there was a, the, the, the district had a deficit budget. Three, but yeah. There yeah. used to be a deficit, and in fact, I mean, the, the, there is some history of having to do short-term borrowing and stuff like that. This is the stuff that over the last couple, last couple of years, we've obviously tried to, um, to shore up. I mean, obviously, we look at our, our projections going out over the next decade and two decades. I mean, with some of the stuff that we've seen with facility planning um, and, and, and just the idea of even getting our working cash fund to where we need it to be. I understand that there's a lot of educational components that we're adding. I'm, I, as a district, I think a lot of us have a lot of pride in, in the services that we've added this year and what that's going to mean in the, in the direction that we've gone with curriculum and everything else like that. Um, in general, though, there is a real concern that we can keep up that kind of momentum when we're getting this tight. Yeah. You know, we get ourselves into a little bit of trouble when we're getting into short-term borrowing or, or something along those lines. So, and so, you know, while this may work this year and it may be working to come in at basically a balanced budget, we're really going to have to be looking at a little bit more of a surplus budget, I think, going forward if we don't this get ourselves into trouble. This trajectory cannot continue. Yeah, and, and that was one point that I wanted to jump in. It's, you know, my firm's classes, we're looking at this budget. I think last year you were able to 
add a lot of positions, um, you're not going to have that option as you go into this particular school year. Anything that we would add at this particular point in this fiscal year, um, even if it's for next year, you, you have to have almost a pay-go system. So how are you going to pay for that? Where's the offsetting um, expenditure going to come? So I, I think that's the biggest thing that I think we all need, all need to be aware of. Why, and, and I completely agree with Darren. Every position that was added, there was uh, really good research and there were really good arguments to add those positions. In subsequent budgets, though, um, two things that I think we need to really, really be aware of, and, and Todd's going to talk about this a little bit in the fund balance, is um, in order to avoid tax anticipation warrants in the future, we, we have got to not only have a balanced budget, but we have to start adding more to that fund balance. And also, in order to um, you know, insulate ourselves from some of these situations at the beginning of the school year that we continue to find ourselves in, whether that's um, an oversized class at one school or another school, it would be my preference in future budgets as a superintendent to have contingency funds. Um, so if there was a need in a particular school year that we all felt was warranted, um, we would have that contingency fund to go to. So you didn't always have to you know, find these special ways to do that. Because this year, with, with that fund balance being so tight, and again, without a contingency, should something pop up, we're going to have a very difficult time without immediately stopping some service that we've already communicated to the community that we're going to provide. So I think the challenge for us as uh, administration is as we talk about subsequent years, is how do we build that fund balance up and how do we account for contingencies? That those are two big things that we're discussing as we move forward. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin, for your remarks. Um, I was going to jump in with mine at the, uh, when we get to fund balances, but since we're already kind of there, I, I, um, just a couple of my takeaways from the conversation. Um, you made the comment at the, the last regular meeting about something along the lines of, we, we, need, we might need to be considering a paradigm shift um, in terms of you know, how, we, how we imagine our spending going into fiscal year 21. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking at um, slide five, and the narrative there that, that, those, that those numbers tell us, and it might not be, it might not actually be with the accurate to phrase it this way, but it seems to me that um, the, our O&M fund is bailing out the Ed fund, fund. And, you know, of course, I mean, we, no one's going to begrudge the board for spending money in a way that's going to be closely impacting students, and that's, that's what we, we are here for it as, a, as an organization, as an institution in the community. But um, when we, are, we, are, we are also have a goal of securing our future, um, that, that makes me intensely nervous about, you know, are we, are we, what aren't we spending in O&M that we should be in order to make sure that our, we're able to keep the lights on, that our, our roofs are in, are in good shape. I mean, with, with, the, with you saying that this budget is as tight as it is, it is, that, tight to the point where it makes you almost, you know, a little uneasy, one catas uh, catastrophe and, and we're, we're in the red for, for um, fiscal year 20. Um, so that's just, that's, that weighs heavy on me. Um, and, you know, I think that when, when a few of us came on in, in 20, 2017, that'd be Jill and Darren and I, um, we voted for the last unbalanced budget. And um, I think the, us newbies at the time, our thought was, well, you know, this is, being, this is, a, this is a year long process and we're coming in in the summer and, and we, we, it would be really difficult um, for us to upend that in, in August as, as new board members. So, um, but we did, the, the message that, we, that that board communicated to the administration was this needs to be our last unbalanced budget. And so that's, that's something that I still believe very firmly in. And that, that's my message to the administration is maybe we do need to think about some kind of, of, of paradigm shift. I mean, I know, I know, spe I know it's going to hurt. I know, it's, I know the community doesn't want to hear about us, you know, maybe um, cutting this or cutting that. Because no matter what you cut, it's going to hurt some kid or it's going to hurt some family. Um, but at the same time, if we are not securing our future, that's going to hurt everybody in the long run. Um, so that's my, my, that's my, that's my, my major comment. And, and my small comment as it pertains to um, expenditures would be to refer everybody to, I think it's slide five, and um, just have everybody look at um, that, that uh, bar graph. Is it slide five? Mine's not yeah. loading. Uh, no, it's the one with um, by object. Yeah. It's expenditures by object, that one. Mm -hmm. So the, um, you know, as, as the board's liaison to the Health and Wellness Committee, just a reminder that, you know, that, that orange slice doesn't look very big compared to the blue slice, but if it's growing at 14% a year, it's, it's, um, it's not sustainable. 
and we, we want to attract the best teachers, and we want to reward them for, for, for working with our kids by offering them generous compensation and, and, um, and benefit plans. But at some point, the day of reckoning is going to come where things are going to be very difficult. So we need to, we need to as a board, um, be very mindful of that and, and making sure that we have a system in place that's sustainable and that, will, and that the community can afford. I do just want to add one, one quick thing onto that, and that was um, Greg's absolutely right. When we came on, on in 2017, we stated, it, all right, it was a, an unbalanced budget. We did trim that by about 50% that, that uh, the deficit there on it. And we stated pretty affirmatively as a board, board of seven that th this is going to be our last deficit budget. I think we're at the point now where we honestly have to say this is our last zero balance budget. We really have to be, like, we got here and that, that, that was a good, that was good momentum. And while we continue to make sure that we're improving the experience for our students, but we are going to have a negative impact on our students five, four or five years from now if we, if we don't get you know, all of this stuff. And, you know, we are in quote unquote good times, economically speaking. And everybody on cable news, as I understand it, is, is, is prognosticating a recession just around the corner. So this is the time we're supposed to be building up reserves. And understandably, we're not. But we're not, we're also putting ourselves in a position where when the state starts prorating again, we are ill-prepared to weather that storm. Correct. Right. And, and we are, I mean, and there's, there's pieces, and we're going to get to the fund balance piece and kind of talk about that piece next, because we do have some issues and in, in, in in pieces to, that we need to be mindful of. And, when you look at that balance of the O&M fund, um, there's a couple of pieces. One, uh, we, one, two snippets of, of, to, to keep in mind is, one, we spend less per student on operations maintenance than most other uh, districts in DuPage County, which county. We're at the low end of that expenditure on operations when you look at the, the comparisons across the board. Um, you know, That's what worries us, which, which is in a lot of ways. Right, because we have, we have all these buildings yeah. And we, we feel like that's borrowing against our future. And, and we've had different things that have tapped into that. Like you were talking about the Ed Fund seems to be getting bailed, and bailed out by that. That's how we originally implemented tech and do our district. I mean, there, there's so many things that have sort of borrowed against that O&M Fund. And I think that's what sits uneasy and, with, with all of us. And, and that manifests itself into that report, that draft report you received in, in June and July, or July of $250 million of, you know, on the fi of the, the future plan of looking at the facilities as w you know, and that $115 million of maintenance uh, over the next 10 plus years. Um, and that's what, you know, results in that piece of, you know, you know needing to address that. The other piece is in that fund balance of, the, of that O&M is the sub-fund of the sinking, the, the, the sinking fund, which is that sub-fund of, of O&M, which is uh, the district has had, it traditionally puts certain amount of interest every year, the board does an abate uh, or does a transfer of interest uh, from the working cash fund into uh, what's called, it's called the sinking fund. It's a sub fund of the operation and maintenance that is to be, that's designated for capital improvements. Uh, it's about $770,000. So when you look at that O&M fund balance, subtract almost $800,000 uh, because that is supposed to be, that's the set aside amount for, for uh, you know, capital expenses. And we have had conversations in the last year with, through the FAC about, can we transfer that to the capital fund? And the, you know, the answer is, we need those funds available at low cash point to be able to pay bills. Um, and so, essentially, you really, we really don't have a, sink, have a sinking fund. We have a part of operational fund that we need for cover balances. So. Uh, that too is a piece, and, and yes, so all of that factors into as we move forward and as we go next into fiscal year 21, we'll start to, yeah, and that is the next step we'll be addressing, and certainly now earlier than, than normal, normal, you know, or earlier in that cycle uh, as we go through. I do want to talk about fund balance a little bit, and I think we'll come back to that FY21 piece and going forward. Um, I go back to the, to the, the revenue pie, and just to, to remind everyone, 29, so we have a 70 plus million dollar budget. $29 million in revenue comes in with 92% of the year complete. 
So we talk about needing to have cash on hand. The, you know, a huge amount of the revenue doesn't come in until the last 25, 30, 30 some odd days. Uh, um, and so that's a piece we, you know, we always make. It's just part of our flow and part of our system. Um, the, some districts do borrow in that process. Um, it's, it's just not a piece you want to get into because it's hard to get out of. These reports, and I'll go through three slides real quick because I just, you know, as a reminder everyone, every month there's a report um, in the month, month to date report. Um, this is one, has a cash flow anal analysis that shows where we're at, where we're behind and ahead. This is as of 6 30, 30, uh, 19. Um, the ahead behind year to date blue number, Part of that is, you know, we had an adjustment in the last year. We did move $1.6 million out of operating into the medical reserve fund, and there was also some bond proceeds that were in cap, uh, 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 working cash fund that moved into capital because that's where they belong to pay out the rest of the, the Lester projects. And so, you know, those came out. So there is some of that piece of adjustment. But the number to look at as far as an impact where we are comparative to, to previous years is this one here is the amount of year-to-date and where we are behind the three-year three -year average, and that's about $870,000 at the end of the fiscal year. So that's less money on hand to help cover costs and expenses uh, during those low cash points. There's that report that we, we, we produce. This page, and I won't, you know, we'll, we'll zero into just the top half of that um, and, and look at where we're at and show you know, the day's cash on, it, every month is going to show where you were at, beginning, at, beginning balance at the month, end of the month, first of the month, and end of the month, and then expenses and revenues against it, and then what we have on hand. So this is as of, this is a cash balance as of June 30th, um, as to where we're ending up. So those are out, those are out in every month's reports so of the board, the community, everyone can go see where we're at. Now, this table I want to run through, this is an example of, of why cash balance is kind of important, which, Obviously, Darren and Greg and, and Steve and Kratz already talked about a bit. Um, the f column on the left, uh, that, those are real numbers. As of <coughs> April 30th, 2019, we had $7 million. We go through the May payroll and bills, and then we have the, July, the June 5th accounts payable and the June 7th gross payroll, because we're coming to year end and we're grow, you know, and there's, there's payouts and there's extra, there's all the stipends and so forth. That's a larger payroll. Um, May receipts, $2.5 million. Now, that's without, I'm sorry, 2.5, that's without the fourth categorical payment from the state. So, so this last year we had an advantage. We took, the state had money in the first time in a decade and made that fourth payment. They make four payments a year to districts, hopefully four payments a year. There's been a year that we've gone, only got three because they didn't have cash on hand. That's been a while back. Uh, um, but it's been consistent for four. Normally that fourth payment comes in June. This year it came in May, so we, were, we, we had an advantage. So we look at where we ended up cash on hand after our theory cash on hand after we paid June, would have been a million four. If we hadn't received that state payment, it would have been under a million dollars, been seven hundred thousand. Now, that actually isn't what really happened because we did take property taxes in on the Monday of the board meeting, of about over ten million dollars. To understand payroll, payroll, payroll is on Friday. We fund on Wednesday because we have to wire, so money has to be on hand. So we were in would have been about $1.4 million cash on hand had we not received that early p tax payment. So when I'm looking at the Friday before a board meeting, not whether if I, you know, if I didn't get that tax, if that tax payment adjusted all to Tuesday, because now or Wednesday, and I have to fund on Wednesday my payroll, I have a different format. So that's how close we get when we're looking at that first week of June, June low cash point. Now let's accelerate out to take our expense growth, 
and take our revenue growth and, and, and project out what we're looking at going into this year. Expenses grow by 5%, revenues growing by 2, 3, 4%, however that, yeah, that's working out. That brings it to a $700,000 balance. Now, presumably we will receive those funds in, from, this, from you know, uh, those property tax monies in. We've increased those pieces, and not all of those expenses may hit prior to June. You know, this is a projection piece. But to understand how important cash balance is to where you know, we need to, you know, we theoretically need to work through our low cash point. It's not about the end of the year, it's about this low cash point position in that first week of June. Um, so that, that you know, so that kind of gives an understanding of what fund balance influence impact is uh, for the district. Um, does that make sense? I think this is a great slide to track on that point. Uh, and, and one of the things that um, the entire administration will be working on is we try and set that magic number for how much do we have to have in fund balances, and then on top of that, how much do we want to have in contingency. To me, this is our, our starting point. This is the side that we go off of, and this is what we really have to center our plans and our discussions around as we go through the budget cycle this year, so you have more of those fund balances available, and then you also have that contingency. So this is our starting point as we go through our conversations. Which leads us into the next year, and that is FY21. And actually, fiscal year 21 starts with October, uh, with an initial levy projection uh, report, and then November with the approval of the tax levy. Uh, from there, we are working through recommendations and adjustments, um, January, February, even, you know, perhaps December, coming back to and looking at um, what does our resources look like for the following year, uh, and how do we, yeah, what's our best allocation piece given our mission, vision, goals, and strategic plan, you know, and, and focus on understanding that there are areas that we need to start to start addressing at a higher level than have previously been. Part of it, fund balance, part of, you know, looking at operations, however that, 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 that shakes out. But looking at with those, with a, with a, a focus and a scrutiny on those areas, technology, I believe, you know, James pointed out to the board, um, Back at, the, back at the April budget hearing, um, some areas that we have, you know, some, some long-term liability um, and replacement areas in technology. Um, and those need to get into a cycle and a schedule uh, that need to be looked at and worked on. Um, so you know, going through that in January, February, giving the board, board uh, projections and understanding and a time for them to make those decisions early in that cycle uh, prior to you know, March deadlines that exist um, for some, for the, your decisions and how you, you know, our recommendations and decisions and how we move forward with that. Uh, then obviously going on through the normal process. The real, the real work, you know, in, in so many ways, budgets are set and established to a large extent by, by March and April. You know, there's, there's, there's once because those graphs, and you look at that $40 million piece of, you know, what that impact is, um, we can move other pieces in supplies and materials and so forth and so forth, um, but you have to move a lot of those to impact that, you know, the big blue chart, which is salaries. Um, we're a service organization. Questions? I, I would just challenge ourselves. Are we aggressive enough with that January, February, February, March timing? You know, so we're not having the same discussion again next year? So are you suggesting I'm moving that up or moving that Moving it up. Mm -hmm. I'm just... Well, it starts in October. That's when we start looking at what our mm -hmm. revenue projections are. This, basically, we're going to come out of, we're going to come out and approve our budget, and it's, this is going to start right over, start, start right over, right over again. So, in, in a lot of ways. no, but I'm just saying those two specific items, you know, review fund balance policy suggestions and projected staffing. If, those, if you know, staffing's our biggest expenditure, yeah. and we're talking about contingency funding and paradigm shifts, do we need to wait five months to have that conversation? Um, in terms of your staff staffing, the final decision, if you're talking about um, certified positions or teachers, that has to take place 45 days from the end of the school year. So how this is laid out January, February, 
in, in my view, you've got plenty of time, uh, you know, to make those decisions. Ideally, you want to make those decisions in March, depending on the calendar, and depending if you wanted to have a special meeting, I mean, you could even make some of those decisions in April. So with that, I think you're, you're in pretty decent shape. In terms of an overall fund balance policy, where, you know, it's not uncommon for some school boards to say, look, we want 30 percent, or we want 40 percent, or 50 percent, wh whatever that number is, you could start that conversation now and really put us to work and, and look at surrounding districts and, and, and look at what their fund balance policy is and set a goal now. I would caution the board, obviously, you're not going to get there in a year, uh, but you could certainly start looking at that as fiscal policy from a school board at any time. You, you don't necessarily have to wait until a, a January or February for that. In terms of the overall staffing, though, I, I do think January or February is fairly aggressive. I, I think that, that's, that's planning ahead, but, you know, fund balance policy, Todd and I and, and the team can certainly start to take a look at that and really combine that with your tax levy conversations, because I think those two pair nicely, if that makes sense. As a, uh, just to piggyback off of Steve, your comments and Kevin, yours, um, as a board, do we want to provide the administration with input or wait for a recommendation to come before we do the back and forth? I'm trying to think through as a board who leads first. I'm okay with going with either direction, to be perfectly honest. I want to make sure that, to Steve's point, we have enough at that time to do the back and forth and see some options on what we can do in FY21 without having to feel like the recommendation is in essence what we have to go with because the next month we're going to be going into staffing mode and whatever else it might be. So I'm trying to think through that from Kevin, I'm happy to refer to you on like what you would prefer, but also like to talk as a board on what we'd like to do. Yeah, I, I think as a superintendent, one of the things that I've heard loud and clear um, tonight, even before tonight, I know that um, we have two as a, as a central office team is two things need to happen. One, we need to really build up this fund balance, and, and the second thing is um, we need money for a rainy day and contingency for each year should these things um, pop up. Um, I, I think one of the things that may help this conversation is if we come back to you and, and give you that target dollar amount, because I think that's missing right now, and so I, I think sometimes it's, it's hard for either, either side to make those recommendations unless you have, you know, you're talking a million dollars, or you're talking $500,000. What is that number we need to build that fund balance? So one of the things that I would suggest is um, allow Todd and I between now and the next meeting to really give that target number, and, and I think then we can come back to you and, and really have a good plan in place. And I think it's going to be a little bit of both. I think it's, I think it's going to be direction from the board, and I think it's going to be recommendations from us. Um, but having that target dollar amount, I think, will really help that, drive that, that plan and the conversation. Yeah, I just want to give a little context to, to the people that are, are new on the day. I said that, that two years ago, we did have a, a real hard conversation about that and sort of leading where we wanted that to be. And that, and that really came around deficit spending. And so we had kind of put a couple of year trajectory on in, in that we needed to see stability there. And I think you're absolutely right in the fact that now we, we've leveled that out, but we're now, we're now at the next phase of it where we need to, to commit. And so the second to last slide that you showed, I think really is a starting point in what, what should our end of the year bank account look like? How much revenue are we taking in? and then we start looking at the services. I'm not here as a board. What I don't want to do is start directing um, curriculum or, or staffing. I want those to come as recommendations, but what I want is to set a goal of where we need to be financially, and then we, we work within that, that framework. And that we have a, a successful model that we kind of started two years ago in, in keeping this balanced. Um, as we look at all the, the stuff that came out of the the uh, master facilities plan and everything else like that, we know that we, we need to continue down this path and not, not, not pat ourselves on the back for balancing this, but now, now move forward in, in finding a way to, to build up that working cash fund. So I, I'd like to, to really build off the, the slide that you have up right now, the second to last slide on the, where you're showing the importance of it and what should those numbers look like at the time of year and, then, and talking about your, and, and included in that not only, not only in, in fund balance, but in that contingency plan, what kind of money should we have in a contingency fund? And if we start that as a, as a jumping off point, what is our five-year goal on that, but then also what can we realistically do in, in, the, in the fiscal year 21? Well, and, and, and one thing is that the reason I brought up the sinking fund conversation is if you look at that projection number of $695,000, that sinking fund is $770,000. Um, as I said, we have a sinking fund in name only because if you were to move, need that money, or move that money out of operation and put that aside where it was inaccessible, um, you would, now yeah, that wouldn't be 695,000, it would be negative um, as you go into that, that first week of June. So 
Um, that is a piece that I think, you know, ideally we need to move in a plan that frees up that, those funds over time in a way that, you know, they're available for what they were, th its intended mm -hmm. uh, purpose was. Um, and that was to, co to cover capital items that necessary. Technically, it was, it was put together so that we could afford the next room. Right. Is really what it was for. And, um, and I'm glad you brought it up today because I've heard it so many times on FAC. So I don't know, for some people, it's the first time they're hearing it. But yes, we technically have a roof fund, a sinking fund, that really we, we can't touch because it would, it would make our working cash fund, fund um, unusable. Right. Or, or, or negative, so. to, to further dive into your question, you know, I think one of the things that's always extremely helpful for any administrative team is having that set fund balance policy or goal from the Board of Education. I, I think in terms of policy, that is one of the strongest recommendations that I would give to any Board of Education is, and again, and again you're not going to get there in one year, but what is that fund balance goal that we feel comfortable with that isn't hoarding money away and, and you know, that will draw the ire of taxpayers, but really having enough where we all feel comfortable as a board where not only do we get out of this whole, um, you know, tax anticipation warrant conversation, but also then have a little bit of money should a roof you know, need immediate replacement or should that rainy day come up. And so some of the work that we've got to do as an administrative team is to come back to the board and show you what those numbers look like if, if you have a certain percentage in mind or a certain cash on hand um, for the number of days. Um, there's some legislation around this where, you know, if you get so high that the voters could have a referendum to come back. But we certainly need to start building up the, that cash on hand because um, one of my biggest aha moments from the night was a, was a Greg's comments when he talked about, you know, times are good right now. It wasn't that long ago where we were sitting in, in school districts around 2010. Everybody kind of shaking their heads going, okay, what just happened? The state is talking about not paying their bills and, uh, you know, really having some, some significant potential consequences as, as school districts. And, um, you know, these are the good times, and, and I, I really do think sooner rather than later um, we need to put these plans in place because um, everything is cyclical. Those tough times are going to be ahead of us no matter how much we all want to avoid them. Avoid them. And, and, again, I think having that fund balance policy in place uh, to, to answer your question, Steve, I think we can start working on that immediately and then bringing you back suggestions as a school board and even talking with our policy committee, um, looking at neighboring districts and doing some of those things so we can get a good recommendation. I think that combined with the tax levy conversation, those two things pair very nicely. So, uh, I just, I'm just curious about the next and how that would work. Mm -hmm. Is this something that, you're gonna, that would be, uh, are the next, is the next time we're going to talk about this, at, about you know, creating policy that's going to come from administration, or is this going to be delegated to the policy committee and then they come up with uh, suggested for us, and then we come back and discuss it. Yeah, I, I think our preference um, as an administrative team is to run those through our normal committee. So to, to bring this back to the, back to the policy committee and say, you know, here are some suggestions. This is something that we've talked about at the board table. We're looking for your opinion on here. Here's some what neighboring districts do with some numbers, and then bring that back to the board. Um, you know, uh, sooner rather than later to continue to have that conversation. That would be my preference, unless the board um, has a different idea. Let's just keep this on our radar and make sure we're getting it on. Uh, mm -hmm. Once we get through this, this budgeting cycle here, this is something that we, these are conversations we, we want to start really having uh, right away. And um, so that we, we don't lose this momentum and we have enough time to, to, to adjust accordingly. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay. That's all. I think Todd and Katie, um, thank you yeah. for all your, your work here. This was great work. Thank you guys. Yeah, I like some of the new charts. Very good. Yeah. I like that fun, the fund balance one I think is an important one that we're going to have to keep. You know, yeah, I, I think we're going to refer back to that one quite a bit. Yeah. We need to be data tells the story, the story and we, we have a story to tell and we need to make sure that, that we have information that's easy to present to the community. I think that's, hel that's a helpful step. Be interested to, to cover your point of what is the policy around it. I can see things like how much money to put away in a sinking fund as a policy. I can see fund balance uh, or cash on hand as of a certain date. I can see fund balance as of the end of the year. It could be any one of those or maybe a few other options, but I'd be interested to know, one, what our benchmark that we feel comfortable with as a district before we start looking externally, um, but also like take into account the neighboring districts and how they uh, arrange their policies. Um, but it could be possibly any of those definitions. And the important piece to the whole, the, to that process is going to be is how, how you work to get to that point. Yeah, because you could add up real quickly to be, okay, we need to find X and that is, put 400, you know, whatever our resources are, $400,000 needs to go here, and that automatically brings your, you know, expenses down. So it's a, 
I think there's, there's going to be a stepping process as you want to to move into that direction to the ideal situation yeah. um, to get to where X, you know, and, and as a, the one graph that you saw with the tables of here's where our balances were on 430, I, I was you know looking at theoretical percentage of expenses, you know, cash days on hand, all you know sorts of things, and went, this is going to be a little too complicated. <laughs> And then came, you know, went through and found that piece that is really a tool that we use uh, as we get into March and April looking to make sure we have funds available um, to pay bills and decided that was a better example than some theoretical structures and formulas. But we can go back and start working through those with either FAC and, and policy and, and come through with a process that gets in the direction that you know, we need to go towards. Thanks. Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. With that, then we'll move on to our reception of visitors, which has an extended opportunity uh, for the Board of Education of the community. Anyone wishing to address the board and ask is asked to state your name, school attendance area, and speak as briefly as possible. The board is allocating a 30-minute time frame for the extended, extended opportunity for the board and community communications. We ask that everyone be respectful of the time limits and be respectful of others and always abide by board policy. I'm assuming no cards? Okay. <laughs> All right. So at this time, I'll open the floor. So much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, then with that, we have a couple of announcements. The district leadership team will meet on Tuesday, August 27th at 3.45 p.m. right here in Longfellow. The financial advisory committee will meet on Friday, September 6th at 7 a.m. at the ASC. And our next regular board meeting will be Monday, September 9th at 7 p.m. at Village Hall. Village Hall. At this time, the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the self-evaluation practices and procedures or professional ethics when meeting with a representative of a statewide association of which the public body is a member? 5 ILCS 122 C16. So moved. Second. Uh, is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchin. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Uh, how much time do we need? 15 minutes? Uh, minutes? Yeah. All right. So we'll go, yeah, after a short recess and we'll go into closed at uh, 620.